Well, Ian, here we are. Yeah, we're recording something specially for the DVD. Um, if, if people are watching this now, they're obviously anoraks or nerds. So um, you haven't even bothered to shave. <laughs> You're right. Which shows I your assume no one was watching. No, and they're not. <laughs> and, and if they are, they're just watching in lonely bedsits. <laughs> So um, we're here to talk about the uh, various uh, hosts, guest hosts that we've had. The guest um, hosts. Since the last couple of series. I'd like um, to talk about the first one of all. First one of all. We have a picture of the first one of all. There he is. That's the picture of the first <laughs> one of all. OK, what do you think? What was the verdict? It was quite desperate that week, wasn't it? It was very desperate. I mean, they didn't have a lot of choice. No. no. They had, they had a, a short list of one. Yes, and unfortunately it was me on it. <laughs> um, it was interesting to do it. I found that uh, it was actually it's a much easier job than what we normally do. Really? What, because yeah. you're reading it? You're reading it and the jokes are there and, you, and you've got to sort of, you know, what passes through a production team in today's television <laughs> atmosphere, st sitting around giving you jokes and you just sit there and read them out, you know, and then occasionally you say, yes, yeah, very good, two points. And you don't have to make anything up, it's all there, really. So I found it sort of, like, reasonably relaxing. But I thought you did basically a parody of someone reading an autocue. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, with, a, with a certain sort of, like, you know, there was a certain... I think it was a certain class to it. I should have worn a cravat, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Somebody from the Daily Telegraph came up to me the next day and said, what was it like, and, you know, thinking it was going to be a disaster. And I said, it was an absolute triumph, <laughs> which completely stunned <laughs> yeah. them. But it's, you know, as, as we... As but they as loved we... it. I mean, just, I mean, the punters in the audience, because it was you doing something different. Absolutely, absolutely. I can't remember. Who was, who was you that night? Ross Noble Oh, Ross me. Noble. Oh, right. Well, yeah. And so he'd he... been on the show the week before. He'd been on the show the week before, and uh, it kind of went to his head a little bit, and he wasn't as good as he could have been. But, um, you know, that just shows you the, 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 you know, the, the quality of the person that normally sits there. <laughs> Have you ever fancied doing it? Um, Were you approached? Um, I was approached, but, and, and I, got, I got rebuked by Boris Johnson, mm -hmm. um, who said, um, you know, why haven't you been um, on the chair? And I said, well, I edit a magazine. And then he gave me a funny look and said, so do I. And obviously it hadn't occurred to him <laughs> that he should show up there during the week, really. Um, but it's quite hard work, isn't it? You do three days or four days. Well, yes. I mean, you do sort of get an idea of what the, uh, of what the production team is doing and all the work they put in, and they do sort of care about how the joke is phrased and is salmon a funnier word than archbishop or, or whatever the examples are. Yeah. It depends what the story is. You know, if you say an archbishop spawns every summer, it doesn't really make much sense. No. If you say there's a gay salmon who's just become head of the Church of England, that doesn't make sense either. So you've yeah. got to choose between... Arch it's, the, it's the classic archbishop salmon quandary. Joke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I found it remarkably easy, but uh, I sort of I did miss me not being there at the end. Yes, the end and it was so. annoying you delivering the stuff because it meant I couldn't sort of have a go at you because you were the host. That's right, which That's was right. tiresome. So um, so okay, so that was the beginning. I, I took and the... then they then there was a sort of who on earth can follow that? Yeah, exactly. And it was Anne Robinson. There we are. There's Anne Robinson. I remember her coming on and thinking, I'm going to lose this because the last time she was on was when she used to work for Robert Maxwell, mm. and. Um, I think there was some feeling that because she was new to the job, we perhaps shouldn't bring this up. Yes. So I did. Yes. Um, and she started deducting points. She's very, she's very touchy about that, isn't she? Because she wrote... Because uh, Private Eye sort of famously was about the only publication that was printing the, the truth about Maxwell while he was still alive. Mm. And uh, she wrote an incredibly... Uh, Groveling. Groveling article the day after he died, yeah. didn't she? Saying he was a giant and sort of larger than life and, and, and he'd employed her mm. at a huge salary. Mm. Mm. So I thought that'd be funny to bring up and she didn't. No, so that, no. That added a bit of spice. I think she was, I think she was a bit sort of slow as well. I think it, it, it's, it is one of those jobs. It's quite, it, it's, it looks easy, but there is, a, there is a certain style to it. You've got to sort of have a bit of pace to it. And I think when people are reading the autocue, they do sometimes tend to just think... I'd better talk quite slowly because the autocue, the words are appearing very slowly and they sort of go to the speed of the autocue mm. rather than dictating the way it should be done. And she's more used to panto, isn't she? She is more used to The panto. weakest link is more sort of grand dame in black. Exactly. Delivering Exa her put-downs. Exactly. Um, so that was her. Um, we then had um, the Joe Brand look-alike, <laughs> which was uh, John Sargent. Now, he a had touch of class. A very, very much a touch of class. He had made a big impact, hadn't he, as... Uh, because when we're often, I'm often asked, and I'm sure you are, who has been your, you know, your most favourite guest ever? And I often choose him. Mm. Because when the first time he came on, there was with no expectation at all that he could, would be remotely amusing. He no, was... ITN's political editor, yeah. um, he came on. He'd never I mean, publicly cracked a joke, or not for 20 years or something. But he had um, actually done some work with Alan Bennett, hadn't he, in the mid-60s. He'd appeared in Alan Bennett's sketch show, which the BBC, in its uh, ultimate wisdom, wiped uh, <laughs> so we could get the troop into the colour 1965 and all its glorious detail. Um, so how do we think he did? How did we think John Sargent did? He was good. Um, I liked him. I, I liked the idea that the host might know the answer to the question. Yes. Um, yes, he, he brought bottom. Yeah, but <laughs> he had bottom. 
Because um, some hosts, you just feel that they might just read it out and have not a clue what was going on. I was a bit like that, <laughs> yeah. which I think is what you were referring to. I am, yeah. And at one point you said, uh, well, what does that mean? I said, I don't know. <laughs> it's not written down here. How would I know that? Or indeed when Boris did it, when you felt not only have you not read this autocue ever before, you've no idea what's going on. No, exactly, which brings us, yes, it brings us to Boris Johnson. So let's have, ah. a, let's have a, a look at Boris there, one of his uh, saner moments. <laughs> Uh, yes, he, he had to read something out about Amanda Holden and Neil Morrissey, mm. uh, which I think had been some, and Les Dennis, which I think had been some story in the, in the press at the time. And as you pointed out, you, what you asked, I think, do you know who any of these people are? <laughs> yeah, because I knew who one or two of them were, and I thought I would get one up on him. Mm. But it was equivalent. Charlotte Church read out members of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. Obviously, didn't have a clue who yes. any of them were, yes. and that was Boris reading out people from Heat. Yes, not, <laughs> not a clue. <laughs> people often say, uh, you know, it, it, it was one of their favourite ever episodes because he was completely. He has that kind of air of sort of like, what on earth's going on? Mm. And he promised a coconut, didn't he? Yeah, uh, give that man a coconut. I think he said to me. And somebody from the production team ran out of, of LWT, where we film it, went as far as Bermondsey, I think, to buy a coconut and brought it back. But he was genuinely impressed by that, wasn't he? Yes. The idea that it could actually happen. What I liked was just, you'd never know what's coming with him. He, he said to me before we were going on, he just said, do you know what the Tory policy is on immigration? And I thought he was about to shock me. Mm. And I said, no. And he said, no, nor do I. <laughs> and that was it. He thought I might help him out. Yes, yes. So that's Boris, which brings us to um, Charles Kennedy. People thought it was a bit of a gamble, him, him doing the show. Yeah. What did you think? Well, I mean, he's had a reputation and they've said, it's chat show Charlie and, um, you know, they say, oh, he's not a proper politician. And he is, the, you know, the leader of a party. It was quite, mm. quite a coup to get him on. Mm. Um, mm. I thought he did really well, mm. and he always maintains that um, if you get away with it, it's like three years of visiting fates and opening supermarkets yes. in your constituency. He, I remember he was very careful, though, wasn't he, of the auto queue? He was very sort of like he was quite sort of deliberate. He, he was as if he, he, he just wanted to make sure that he wasn't straying into sort of controversial territory. And I mean, he he wanted to look serious, yeah, um, as well as doing it, but. And if you remember, Mo Molum had been on the Graham Norton show, yes. taking part in a, a marriage of some dogs. Yes. You know, I think she'd just been um, a cabinet minister. So, in a sense, you know, the ante has been upped. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, OK, so that was, that was Charles. So he reckons that, you know, we'll see in the next election whether, yeah, that, whether it worked. Whether the Havoc News View game has, has worked. Um, we then had Jeremy Clarkson. Well, Clarkson was on as a host. Uh -huh. And in the next series, um, when William Hague was um, in the chair, I think it was sort of right-wing special, mm. um, they had Clarkson on again and he managed to offend a lot of people by saying that he'd deliberately run over a fox. Oh, yes. Um, yes. And we thought, or I thought, didn't you, that he'd just made it up? Yeah. For effect. Yeah. He said he'd run over this fox and he could have braked. Anyway, there's absolutely furious letters to the paper, people saying, we're going to prosecute you, mm. Um, mm. which, of course, he just loves. Yes, good publicity um, for him. Um, so he sort of, uh, yes, that was one of the more controversial moments, I think, in the whole history of the show. Yep. <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson said, I deliberately ran over a fox. Yeah, yeah, you can attack the government, but don't do animals. No, no. People don't... genuinely hate it. They do, they do. And uh, Jeremy Clarkson, that brought, uh, he was the last host of that, uh, of the uh, autumn oh, series that last Mo year. Molan was on that show. Yes, she was, wasn't she? And they continued that fight about whether Brunel or Churchill should have won the greatest Britain. That's right, that's right. And he was furious about losing, so he just kept arguing. And Yes. And I think he told Michael Gray to shut up at one point, yes. didn't he? Which was a, that was a, new for a host. It was a refreshing change, <laughs> wasn't Assertion. it? Assertion. <laughs> <laughs> so he was... Uh, so he Jeremy, was pretty good. Yeah, he was pretty good. So Jeremy Clarkson uh, took us through to the end of, uh, of that series. And uh, when the spring series, 2003, started up, it was uh, Martin Clunes who yeah. uh, did, a, did an excellent job, I think. Um, we still hadn't found a permanent host. No, no, and we, we decided that because the, uh, the series before with different hosts had gone so well in terms of it made it fresh, uh, the viewing figures were higher than it had ever been. Yeah, I think that appealed to the powers that be, didn't it? Absolutely. The fact yeah. the ratings went up. When well, you've got a long-running show, which is basically the same format, part of the problem is how do you keep it fresh? Yeah. And if the man in the middle or the person in the middle is a completely different person every week, then... You can't help but be fresh. Yeah, and we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Certainly not with Martin there, but he's got no. a lot of energy, hasn't he, Martin? Yes, he, he really... he, he, terrific comedy energy, and uh, he's you know he, en he enjoys the show, and uh, you know he's he's a comic actor as well, and he knows how to deliver a line. And I think the you know the real sort of pace was was right up, and uh, he was he was very good. And uh... and I love the fact that his image after years of men behaving badly is supposedly this sort of mm -hmm. lager swilling fool, but actually mm. he's terribly well informed. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> rather erudite. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but uh, he's been hiding it for years. Well, yes, for commercial reasons. <laughs> uh, now, our next one was, uh, having taken, I think, the, uh, the example of Charles Kennedy, was William Hague. Yeah. Well, this was my fault, because I saw him speaking at a dinner um, mm -hmm. where he made this speech and then answered questions, and he was very, very funny. Mm -hmm. um, which, I, you know, again, shouldn't have been a great surprise, because he used to be good in the Commons. Yes. And he told this brilliant Bush story that he's actually met George Bush, and it's mm -hmm. always good having people on... Who's Can you remember what part the, story of the story was? Yeah, um, he'd met George Bush as part of, you know, the caring conservatism drive, and uh, Bush had said to him that he was thinking of, of planting um, uh, listening stations for one of these Star Wars projects, sort of missile, in all the European countries. <laughs> and Haig had said, you know, I don't think that's going to be very popular. A lot of Europeans don't want American stations there. And um, Bush had said to him, I got a secret plan for that, William. And Haig had said, What is it? And Bush said, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Just slightly chilling, really. Yes, it is a little bit, isn't it? Um, but it, it? And I said to him, I saw him at this dinner, and I said, you know, why don't you do the show? Mm, um, mm. And he did do it. And, it. and it was extraordinary, I think, seeing someone liberated from that being jolly careful. Yes, um, yes. But showing what they were capable of. Absolutely. Um, at this point, I should put in a personal note, I was extremely miffed that, uh, when I watched the programme because several of my retorts to William Hague were edited uh, yeah. out of the show. But I've been, uh, I've been assured that they've been put back in, especially for this DVD. Yeah. Um, because somebody said to me, a taxi driver said, oh, you didn't have much to say to that William Hague, which annoyed me, because mm. I did. You did. Uh, and then I didn't, and now I have again. <laughs> So William Haig is back, and uh, I've had... Plus your retorts. Yeah, exactly. But it did prove that thing that people say, oh, it's always cut um, to make the, the um, you and I look better. Yes. Whereas I think it's usually cut to make us look as stupid as possible. Well, I think... That one was. I think, I mean, generally, that's speaking the way that things are cut. If, if, the, if the guests, the, the, you know, the other two people who are sitting there as the panellists ever say anything amusing, it's always kept in because, mm. you know, it, it brings a new freshness to the show. But we often get edited, don't we, ruthlessly. Yeah. You know. Um, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> right, the next person after William Hague... They won't get in. No, they won't get in. They'll cut that. As yeah. a, you know. But then they'll just sort of they'll realise who's watching the DVD. You haven't <laughs> bothered to shave. There's some bloke in a bedsit. You're you know. wearing a, a caftan. Uh, well, I'm well, working quite tonight. A short one. I'm working tonight at a Greek restaurant. <laughs> um, you know, who's going to care? Who's going to watch? So William Hague mm. set the template. We thought, right, we've no, we've got a sort of person. We know exactly who it should be. Yep. From now well on, well informed, well informed, political, uh, political, mainstream, mainstream. Well used to making speeches. So we immediately jumped. We took the William Hague baton and came up with Charlotte Church. Yeah, a brilliant choice. She was absolutely wonderful, wasn't she? <laughs> uh, it shows you the quality of the show. If a, if an ex-leader of the Conservative Party and a seventeen-year-old girl can host it, then yep. <laughs> they must have <laughs> universal appeal, I suppose. <laughs> so um, I can't remember what she was like now, Charlotte. But she was she she, was, she wasn't terribly up on the politics. She no, was, she was good on on the celeb gossip. Oh, we we did a thing about Justin Timberlake, I think. That's right. Um, no, I was cut ruthlessly. Were you? Yeah, I was trying to ask her what um, what her new career as a crossover artist from um, girl singing opera to mm -hmm. major rap star, mm -hmm. how she was going to affect this transition, and that didn't get in. No, no. All right, so that was Charlotte Church. So she was good. She brought a sort of a, a different quality again to it, um, where she didn't sort of really care she what young, she was doing. She was young, though. It's like being on with my own daughter. It was a bit peculiar, I'll wasn't tell you it? what they cut as well. Yeah. I told her to go to her room at one point. Yes. But they thought that was too much. Well, I'm sure it's, <laughs> I'm sure it's in the DVD, because they wouldn't, want to, they wouldn't want to annoy us, would they? No. Then we had... Um, the next one after that was... Uh, perhaps not as famous as the other people we had on, was uh, Alexander Armstrong. Um, Armstrong and Miller. Armstrong and Miller. Uh, two straight men in a one double act. <laughs> um, <laughs> Generosity <laughs> being the key point of this particular commentary. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> very key. Uh, he was good, wasn't he? He, he was good. Of, he was very funny. Um, lots, of, lots of pace. He'd done a Pims ad. Yes, which was quite amusing. Yes, it is a very funny advert, isn't it? Um, um, he was posh. Yes, which you know was refreshing. Very posh. Now, is he is he Oxford? Is he Cambridge? Or Cambridge, he, I is, think. Is he yeah. Cambridge? Not one of yours. No, no. no. But he's he's the right sort of chap. Yes. <laughs> then after Alexander Armstrong, we had another half a double act. Half a double act. Hugh Dennis of uh, Punt and Dennis, which is not uh, a Cockney rhyme slang for two very rude words. It's uh, he was good. Uh, he was good. He was uh, a bit nervy, I think, at first, but then settled into it. I think it's hard for people to sort of 
Because well, he's no... been a guest before. Yeah, a very good guest. He was, he's the Archbishop's son, Bishop's son. Bishop's son, yes. Who'd written yes. a book about cycling. That was good. I yes, enjoyed the, that. The Cycling Bishop. The Cycling Bishop. Um, it's, it sounds like it should be a Monty Python <laughs> sketch, but it, it, it is real life. Um, so after him, we had um, Sanjeev, Sanjeev Bhaskar. He opened it in Punjabi, didn't he? Yes. Which I think gave yes. them a bit of a shock. Exactly. It sort of opens into that crucial international market <laughs> that we've been after for the last uh, 14 years. Yeah, and failed to get. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I think he sort of he handled it quite well, I seem to think. Yeah, and, but he's uh, done lots of chat shows, hasn't he? I mean, yeah. the Kumars and... Uh, th yes, exactly. So, yes, the, the, the job he does in the Kumars, I suppose, is, is essentially... He's sort of the host, isn't he? Yeah, it's essentially the same kind of thing. And I think he was also one of those people that came on and people thought, oh, he's very good, perhaps he should do it. As a mm. lot of people in this series, like Martin Clunes and Alexander Armstrong... Well, every time someone came on in the press the next day, it said, they're the new host. They're the new host. Uh, um, we, which is, is, is great that it keeps people guessing because we've not made any decision and no. we, maybe we'll just carry on having different people all the time. Um, which then I'm sure we won't be asked. No, no, exactly. <laughs> um, we'll just find out one day. Um, it's, it's the Duchess of York, mm. which um, brings us to uh, perhaps the, the unlikeliest host we've ever had, but, yes. uh, but, a, but a very memorable one. It was sort of end of term japes, really, and uh, we had uh, Bruce Forsyth, which was personally... <laughs> I think we had a different experience about we this. Did. We did. You've never been so happy in your life. I just couldn't <laughs> believe it was happening. You, I think you see, when he, he brought out the card game and said higher or lower, you, yeah. you said, I think this programme can get much lower, which is very really amusing. So was it a bit of a surreal twilight world for you? Sort of... I had no idea what was going on a lot of the time. <laughs> Again, I don't know if they left this in. It didn't go out on the broadcast, but at one point you said Ian didn't have ITV on his telly at mm. home. <laughs> there was no button, and I'd never seen that show. No. So I literally didn't know what he was on about. Yes, it's a parallel universe, ITV, the ITV game show. If you're not aware of it, you really don't know what's going on. But um, someone said to me that... Um, Iraqi play your cards right was probably the worst taste um, <laughs> joke ever put out yes. on BBC One, but he got away with it. Well, it was, it, was it was actually worse. I think one of the writers suggested play your curds right. Oh, so God. that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you say it's the worst taste so, joke, but one, but one, but yeah. one. There was one worse than that. So I think by the time people buy this, this DVD, we would have already done the uh, uh, autumn series in two thousand and three. So yeah. who knows who, who's hosted it? Uh, Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Keith Chequin. Keith Chequin. So um, there we are. Uh, you can stop watching this DVD day. DVD now. Go DVD out. Day. Get, DVD day. DVD. It feels like we've been here for a day. You can get. You can stop watching this now and go out and get a life. <laughs> As indeed we intend to. Good night. <laughs>